Hello and welcome to In Our Community. My name is Emmy Apabio. I'm here today with Christine Mincheff. Christine Mincheff is a third order Franciscan and also a student of, of religion and prayer. So we're going today to talk about specifically about prayer and how it's how it how people approach prayer as they come from different religious traditions. So hello Christine. Hello. Thank you. Welcome back. Uh, and how are you doing? Pretty good. Cool. Good to hear. Um, so so our conversation today is going to focus kind of more more fully on the concept of prayer, but as we before we kind of step into kind of the deep dive, I wanted to get your get your thoughts on one thing I've been contemplating lately and I and I don't really have an answer for it is what prayer is and how it differs from meditation and contemplation like what these these th what mm -hmm. these three things are, how they're similar and then how they're different. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I'll start with meditation. Meditation is a conscious, focused exploration of a particular concept or uh, a, a verse or a phrase uh, or even a word. Uh, contemplation is is more uh, personal and much more isolated. And so, and you and rather than having a focused exploration of it, you let the word uh, or the concept allow you allow your mind to freely work around it and associate it with other things so that you can um, you can maybe get something deep more deep out of it um, that you couldn't if you if you focused on it so it, it's a, a much less focused and much more individual process prayer on the other hand is, a, is actually a conversation and I have, I have a phrase here that I really like that describes what what prayer is um, and uh, this is from a book that I'm using for uh, studying about um, prayer and things in general. Prayer is the act of making whatever we do a cause for meeting and knowing God. Prayer is the movement of God to humanity and humanity to God. The act of meeting. So prayer is a little bit different than the other two in that it's two-sided. So prayer opens us not only to speak to God, but to listen to Him as well. And may I ask what role prayer, pray, what role prayer plays in your life? <laughs> it's a big role because it's a, a one of the ways to um, not only to show love for others, but also to um, teach myself to be more loving to others is that is that prayer is that conversation with God in which I can um, pick out you know so, some things have been annoying me and God says well what about these things you know these are good things and or even if there is nothing good God says you still you know you're still going to pray for this person you're still going to 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 be loving if you can so um, it's it's a very huge part of my third order uh, life um, is prayer. Uh, Francis uh, of Assisi said that he wanted people to get to that point where they were praying without ceasing and I think what he was talking about is your life being a prayer and it's a very long journey that has a lot of stops and starts and a lot of side roads that you take and I'll never be there at the end of it but I, it, the, the joy is in the, in the journey. So as you, as you talk about a journey it makes me wonder when you before you started studying or when you first started attending church what was your how did you approach prayer then and then how do you approach it now prayer then for me you know the the sort of rote prayers uh, the episcopal church to which i belong has some uh, ritual prayers which are said a certain way uh, every time and and for me that that actually created a framework for me to work on my own my own prayer on my own personal prayers after church and so forth. And also what I think it provides for you is, is at those times when your heart is not in it, if you still perform those ritual prayers and speak them and say them with a group of others, it will bring you back. It's like the anchor that stops you from floating away completely. Mm. And I found it very, uh, very uh, comforting and soothing at a time in my life when I was going through some some big things. I was getting a divorce and I had a young child to care for and 
uh, was going to be moving away to a new community and starting a new career. So there was a lot of really big changes all at once. And it really helped me get through that. Even if I didn't have time for my own personal prayers, those rote prayers, those ritual prayers, were so important to keeping me grounded. Hmm. And then do you still, do you still hmm, engage in those rote prayers now, or do you, is prayer something that's a bit more personalized for you now? I, I engage in both kinds. Um, on Sundays when I'm with the, with the congregation, we indulge together in the ritual prayers. And um, what I've learned over the years is that my own mind and my own heart, can, my soul can wander while we're saying those things and explore little areas of them that are, that are occurring to me today. So even though they're rote and ritual prayers, they don't close me off from being able to do my own feelings and have my own thoughts and my own prayers inside. But I also, at the same time, um, am doing my own prayers at home. Um, as a part of my rule, my own personal rule of life, uh, I pray at least 20 minutes twice a day. And some of those prayers are intercessions for others. And um, I have learned recently that I need sometimes to make some intercessions for me as well. So uh, that's part of the learning process. Oh, nice. Um, I guess one of the, when I, as I was contemplating how this conversation would go, I, I reached out to some people for, to, to find out what they would want to know about prayer. And a couple of the questions that people had were, uh, is prayer ex always tied to religion? Or can you, as a, as a non-religious person, can you still pray? Probably people do. Um, in Buddhism, for instance, Buddhism is, Buddhism is not actually a religion. It's a way of life. Buddha did not want to be worshipped. And it is not a religion of worshipping the Buddha. It is, a, it is a way of life of following the Buddha and listening to his teachings. And so they don't specifically have a, um, a bunch of prayers, but they consider that conversation with um, whatever higher power they are, are speaking with um, and using the Buddhist techniques and and um, and teachings to guide their their own uh, contemplations and so forth. That's that's prayer in a, in a sense as well. So um, you know, if you're a Buddhist, you're not re you're not necessarily religious, but you are still practicing prayer. That's very interesting. So, as you as you bring up the Buddhist well, way of life, it um, you mentioned that one of the things that you're doing as part of your studies is you're kind of ex you're exploring how prayer is practiced in the different Abrahamic religions. Right. Can you talk more about that? Sure. The Abrahamic religions are um, the Muslims, the Jews, and the Christians. Um, the oldest of those were the, the was the Jewish religion, and of course, we anybody who's read any of the Bible knows the stories about Abraham and Isaac. But Abraham had another son named Ishmael, and Ishmael um, went off to other lands. And um, the Muslims actually believe that Ishmael uh, pretty much started up the way that the Muslim or the Islamic religion uh, in um, in the Middle East. And so for them, the, uh, both sons of Abraham are important. And uh, Abraham is the f considered the father of all three religions. And he, it's his um, uh, relationship with God and his, um, uh, well, his, his whole life was um, that relationship growing and changing him and changing those around him. And so um, that is what has sparked these three great religions of the world. Um, so that's what the Abrahamic religions are. And why, why would you want to study how they pray? Because I simply wanted to know what the similarities were and the differences, and whether learning about those things could um, maybe make my, my life different too. And I, I have some notes on each, which I uh, consider very, very um, interesting. The, 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 there are some similarities and there are some differences. So I'll go through each, and, and I think people can draw their own uh, similarities and differences. Well, why do Muslims pray? First, we're going to start with Islam. Uh, why do Muslims pray? And uh, Because Islam is not only a theory, it's a practice as well. So 
there is no true belief without action on that, on that belief. Prayer is the first and the most important step in the path of Islam. So when um, Muslims pray five times a day, and um, it's like a spiritual diet, uh, it also is a time for them to, um, it, pr prayer cleanses their sins, and um, it removes arrogance from their ego and puts them in their true place as servants of God. And then when, on the day of judgment when they pass away, the first thing about which a Muslim is going to be asked is his prayer life. And uh, the other thing that he needs to be very aware of is the unity of God. There is only one true God. When you say the unity of God, can, can um, I ask you about that? That specifically refers to the fact that the, the Jews also believe in the unity of God but the Christians believe in the Trinity. So it's not three gods, but it's three um, aspects of God. The way we view it, it's three aspects of God. But for, for Muslims and Jews, it appears to be way too close to worshiping three beings and not one. And so they state very specifically and clearly that they believe in the unity of God. So I'm sorry to detour, but I do have a question about that. Sure. So and, and again, as you mentioned the Trinity, it's the first time it's occurred to me. Why? What are the three aspects of God? Why do? Why are there? Why is it a Trinity? The the Christians believe that that Jesus was the Son of God, and um, that the Holy Spirit is that third portion of the of the Trinity: God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And um, the. They're, they're one and the same being. God came to earth to, the Christians believe that God came to earth in the form of Jesus to not only be a human and be human with us, but to also show us that pathway to God and, and tell us what God wanted. Because um, if, you, if you read the early Bible, um, boy, was there a lot of floundering around in the wilderness <laughs> before, they, before they finally figured out what it was God really wanted of them. And um, so, so Jesus came to, to sort of give us another chance to recognize what God wanted from us. And, but because we believe that he is the son of God, that he is, he is God incarnate, that he's actually the same being, but in the, in the, come in the human form. And that um, the Holy Spirit of God is what, what enters us and helps us to understand things more thoroughly. Um, all of these concepts were actually developed in the Middle Ages. They were not they were in the very early church, but not at the time that uh, Jesus was alive. So um, it, it's a puzzle. Um, I guess it's always going to be a bit of a debate as to whether they're legitimate or not, uh, but, um, but, but Christians do believe they're legitimate. And, um, and, but, but Jewish people and um, Muslims do not believe they're legitimate. They believe there is God. He did not have a wife. He did not have a son. And um, I think they probably have some kind of concept of, of the spirit of God, of Allah, uh, being with us and helping us. But I, I'm not sure it's the same as our Holy Spirit as, as we view it. Okay. Sorry for the interruption. <laughs> it's okay. That's a really valid question under the circumstances. <laughs> So um, for the Muslims, then they like like I said, they pray five times a day, and um, they must. And and in part of their um, uh, uh, traditions in praying are to prepare themselves for the prayer. And that's not just mental preparation, but it's physical preparation as well. They clean themselves in a certain um, ritual way, which makes them stand before God in a much cleaner sense, and it um, removes any of the. Um, the things which hopefully, you know, which, which supposedly would keep us away from God. So presenting yourself to God in a in your clean, pure form is what they are attempting to do by their their method of ablutions, and um, and they perform that uh, once, hopefully only once in the day. Um, but sometimes they have to perform it multiple times. It depends on, on whether they did things during the day that they feel in some way made them unclean. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, unfortunately, it's probably not very polite to mention it, but it's some bodily fluids that make us unclean. So uh, <laughs> those things will make them have to perform their ablutions again. Okay. But in addition to that, your clothes need to be clean as well. And you need to cover yourself in such a way that, um, uh, that shows that you have respect for God and that you are prostrating yourself before him, etc. So that's why dresses uh, uh, is, so, is very, so very important to Muslim men and women.
And then the prayers are, are prayed at a very specific time of day, and they have a very specific um, uh, uh, pattern to them. And the specific time of day has a little interesting twist to it. So the Muslims have actually have a site that they can get on on the internet that tells them what the time of day that they're going to be doing each prayer, the five prayers. And the reason for that is that it's to do with the position of the sun in the sky. Mm. So um, they get on this site and it tells them, well, today it's 2.32 or, you know, whatever. And, um, and this site tells them, and also there's another site that you can get on that tells you from your location, you put in, you plug in your zip code, and it tells you where to face and in in where you are to face towards Mecca. Oh. So I thought that was kind of a neat little thing that yeah. Muslims around the world are prepared for that because that means so much to them. Um, prayer can be performed anywhere, uh, but of course you want that place to be a little bit clean and so you try to clean it and if you can't clean it, for instance, dirt's fine, but you want to put a clean cloth over the top of it so you present yourself to in front of God as being clean. And they request that you pray the prayers in Arabic because this is the original rang, uh, language of the Quran and um, they feel that it expresses some of the things more uh, specifically and more, um, more accurately. Mm -hmm. And so um, many, most Muslims will learn the prayers in the, the native um, Arabic, Aramaic language. And then there are certain positions that you take and those again are to do with um, your, your recognition of your presenting yourself before God. Um, certain phrases that they use are very important to them uh, because they reflect their, their views that God, you know, the unity of God and that God is great. And uh, interestingly enough, they occasionally use the word Amin. And I decided to look this up last night, and it's rather interesting. The, the, the original word is a Semitic word, and uh, it basically meant, let's see, I wrote that somewhere. So that's related to Amen? Yes, it is. It's related to Amen, um, although the three religions use Amen differently. So um, the Amen from the, the Hebrew uh, and the Greek uh, means firm or fixed or sure and the, the, what has been said to you is reliable or trustworthy and um, that is similar to the way Christians use it it sort of says what's just been said is really important you should have taken note of that <laughs> and but but to the um, to the Muslims um, Amin is a word that they use to end some of their prayers they don't end them all with Amin but it means please answer this prayer uh, so I thought that was rather interesting that the word comes from the same root, but they use it a little differently. That is interesting. Um, prayer should be said in a group or a congregation if possible. The prayer leader is called the imam. He is not the same thing as a priest. And uh, he, it, he's usually a man that in the community is considered to be most knowledgeable about the Quran. And um, this person is chosen by everybody and uh, they lead certain phrases out loud and the rest of the prayer can be prayed silently or whispered softly. Uh, sometimes a leader recites passages from the Quran while everyone listens in, intently and um, the Friday prayers must be said in the mosque. Uh, that is the, um, the goal of all um, Arabs is to, or of all Muslims is to say their prayers in the mosque with the group on Fridays. So the bare minimum purpose of prayer is to take you away from your daily activities for a few moments to remember God. The ultimate goal should be to worship God with such concentration that it is as if you're standing directly in front of Him. Really means a lot to them. And then how does, uh, what, it, what, what would the purpose of prayer be in the, in the Jewish faith tradition? So in the Jewish tra faith tradition, um, they have a lot uh, a very, some very similar practices. There's a certain amount of preparation that goes on before prayers. Not only do you want to be clean, but you also want to wear certain items of clothing. 
um, the prayer shawl that many of us have seen um, has certain, it's, it's, uh, the colors are very important and also the fact that at the corners there are little tassels and um, those fringes or tzitzits at each corner are, um, are there to uh, remind them of all of the blessings from, from God. Mm -hmm. And it's customary when you begin the prayer to kiss those little, little tassels. Uh, is it only men that wear the prayer shawl, or do women wear it uh, as well? Men wear it, I believe, in some of the um, what they call the Reformed congregations, the more um, westernized congregations, that women can wear them as well. But I believe it was originally a, a man's garment. Um, they also put on things that um, we have called phylacteries, but this is not a word that Jewish people like. Well, can you say that one more time? Phylacteries. What is um, th these are the little things. You'll see some Jew Jewish men praying, and they have a little box attached to their forehead, and it looks uh, like a little funny little box. Or they'll have that. one on their hand. Um, frequently, if you see uh, Orthodox Jews, okay. you, will see, you will see it. Um, probably the the reformed ones are not quite as um, big about that, right. but these are in 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 the in the Hebrew language they're called tefillin. That's a word they prefer, and these are actually come from some phrases in um, Deuteronomy and uh, Exodus where they are advised when they pray to bind the words of God to their he forehead and their hands, and mm -hmm. that's why they wear these on their forehead and their hands. I see. They also place some words of blessing on their house posts. Their, their lintel posts, those are called mezuzahs, I think, mm -hmm. and um, and then the, the, the cap worn by men, we call it the yarmulke, that's the Aramaic word for it, but the Hebrew word is the kippah, and that is also, again, kind of like the Muslim traditions, it's a garment that says you are presenting yourself before God in humility and, and in purity. And um, it, it, Jewish prayer is both structured and spontaneous. And there are three main forms, praise, petition, and gratitude. And those were existent in the, in the Muslim prayer as well. In fact, the, uh, each prayer has those three parts to it, the praise part, the um, a petition part, and the gratitude part. Um, and they're all meant to fill us with awe and inspiration. And um, together, they'll lead us to a better understanding of ourselves. And not because God makes us better, but because the prayer discipline helps us focus on our most important goals. Singing and silence are also part of uh, the prayer life of Jewish uh, persons. Um, uh, singing and, uh, um, is not uh, welcomed in um, Muslim prayer as far as I could find, but it definitely is welcomed in Jewish prayer practice. In fact, sometimes they think it makes you um, because we associate and we learn a lot of times things associated with music, they think that helps you to learn the prayers better if you sing them. And they may be right. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Um, a rabbi is also not a priest. Not the same thing as a priest at all. A rabbi is a learned person. I and mean, they do go to seminaries now and they do uh, become sort of ordained as a, as a rabbi. But their, their function is not t uh, typically this, the, technically the same as a priest's function. And um, they, uh, they help with the, the prayers as well. Um, prayers can be said alone, they can be said in your family, or they can be said in the temple. Or in, 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 in the, um, not the temple, uh, the synagogue. Uh, the temple doesn't exist. The temple was destroyed 70 years after uh, Christ was crucified, and it has never been rebuilt. And prayer it represents a, a um, a replacement for the sacrifices that were made in the temple that the Jews could only make in the temple. They couldn't make these sacrifices anymore so prayer was devised as their means of making the, that sacrifice. And until the temple is rebuilt, that's where it's going to be, yeah, prayer. Okay. And then the, in the Christian tradition? In the Christian traditions, we, we certainly have um, uh, preparation times. I, I think part of why uh, it used to be a tradition, I don't think it is so much anymore, but it used to be a tradition that on sun, Saturday night uh, you laid out your best clothes and you, you know, you, everybody took their baths and their showers and whatever and they prepared themselves to go to church the morning. in the morning. You prepared yourself clean and in your best clothes and uh, 
I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, um, I, I have no evidence for that, I'm assuming that that is a similar tradition to the Jewish and the Muslims where you're trying to present your best self um, as an honor to God. The so, Sunday best. The Sunday best. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and then uh, as far as prayer goes, we, we still use um, praise and petition, um, gratitude. And there are a number of ways that prayer has been described. Um, prayer can, uh, in, when we first start praying as Christians, we start praying intentional prayers. Um, you're welcome to, to pray for things that you want. Doesn't mean to get them, but you're welcome <laughs> to pray for things that you want um, because this helps you to recognize who you are. And then um, as time goes by and you recognize who you are and what things are truly important, your prayer actually changes and becomes less intentional and more, um, more mysterious and, um, and sort of uh, ethereal. Prayer um, certainly becomes a different, um, a different method and certainly different reactions to, to prayer. Um, I find myself when I'm deep in prayer, that's a very mystical place to be. It's not um, uh, a... Um, you know, I don't have like lists that I'm going through. Yep, yeah, I pray for this one. Yep, did that one. I'm, gonna, you know, it, it's actually a very mystical place to be, and things are coming to you kind of naturally, and and those are the things that are, and when, and then when you're praying, you're not praying for specific things. I mean, I pray for my enemies. I don't pray that they stop, you know, trying to hurt me. I pray that whatever fear and pain in their life causes them to react in this way will be you know solved it will be dealt with so that they won't have that fear and they won't have that that those feelings of violence so it it helps me to pray in a much more um well it's it's i i don't know but it, it's it's a much more mystical way to pray because you're you're really getting at the root of the causes of the things you're praying about that makes a lot of sense well, thank you so much for sharing, <laughs> for sharing um, this information, and for sharing also a bit more about your your approach to prayer and what you um, get out of the experience. Do you have any resources that you might like to suggest for people who want to learn more about prayer themselves? Do you know the way I learned about this? I went to the public library. I found uh, some really nice books about uh, Jewish uh, religion altogether and prayer. One of them was one of those understanding books. They're a little bit like you know, Jewish for dummies kind of thing, but it was, <laughs> it was really a good book. And then there were also some um, resources online about Muslim and Muslim prayer that were very helpful. And I just, you know, do it. Go look it up. Right. Well, Christine Minjep, again, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for watching. You've been watching in our community. We'll see you next time.